Well, hello, sports fans. It's your favorite program, Socialing the Distance. Today, we're with Michael Bergman. He is the president of Portland Track, and I got to meet him when I was at the Portland Track Festival. Michael, great to see you. Great to see you, Larry. And it's thank really you for taking the time to today. I wanted our readers uh, at Run Blog Run and the Running Network to appreciate the amazing things you guys are doing in the land of Portland. And, you know, we love that city. And it's, uh, I like your program, Tracklandia, too. And, you know, it's, uh, but the, so you do two events. And is it normally that close together, the Portland Track Festival, like kind of on the weekend? And, in Stumptown uh, Twilight a few days later? Yeah, so historically the meets have been, um, the Portland Track Festival is usually the week of the NCAAs that are in Eugene. Mm-hmm. And um, we we get, a, you know, the pro athletes that are competing, it's usually um, just after pre or before. And then the Stumptown Twilight has, has historically been a last chance qualifier for okay. one of the championships so we cool. we basically move adjust the dates based on how those meets are starting to line up now in when the pandemic started in 2020 how did that affect your events we were really the last to um put out that we were going to cancel the 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 big portland track festival at lewis and clark and partly was that was because of the with the pandemic and gatherings and just the availability of tracks Lewis and Clark was not available um, and so we pivoted that summer to creating some small pop-up meets we mm-hmm. we named them the big friendlies yeah talk to me about the big friendlies how did that work and what were the I'm learning and observing the level of sophistication that's required to put on an event in these trying times. This was the first season of all this craziness. How, what, what, give us a little bit of a viewpoint into that. Yeah. So, so we understood that the coaches and the athletes still needed to, you know, one, they were still training, they were training in their pods and their groups. And um, that was, you know, they still need to hit qualifying times whenever the next championship was going to be, whenever they needed to, you know, keep their contracts. And so we have the um, benefit of in being in Portland, having a couple of great training groups here from Bowerman and Pete Julian's group, um, you know, and also in the Northwest, Oregon Track Club Elite out of Eugene and uh, the Brooks Beast. And so we, you know, we have really good trusted um, relationships with all those teams through the Portland Track Festival. And we really asked them what they needed. And and our our the mantra with Portland Track is really um, about athletes first. And and so we kind of looked at, okay, we couldn't gather, we couldn't bring fans in. We had this uh, small little production team that does the track landia shows. And and so we figured out that we could put on safe COVID um, protected meets with all the testing protocol. Um, and and the, the, the key thing was to find locations where we could pop these up without really announcing it. They were kind of like in secret locations. And yeah, that's what I kind of dug about it too. That was really fun, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, so the only one who, the only people that in, in fact, you know, even athletes and coaches could not bring family or friends or whatever. We, we were really strict about it. And, and so, <clears throat> so we, we ended up, you know, we had the first one at Jesuit high school and, um, and that was with Oregon Track Club Elite and Pete's group. We tried to get um, Bowerman to join us that one. But I think their training cycle was a little different. So Jerry had an inner squad meet a little bit earlier in the week. So that kind of threw that off a little. And that's what led us to McKenzie River. And and we wanted to basically invite other teams like Wassell and uh, the Brooks Beast and OTC Elite. And, and these... And it was really, you know, pretty fun. It was actually really fun because the athletes got to know each other, regardless of what brand or what team they ran for. They they knew each other, but it was in a whole different, you know, it was a whole different 
atmosphere where runners are runners and and they they enjoyed being around each other and they enjoyed competing um, and they also appreciated the fact that we um, were able to provide that for them so um, and it was you know there were two hour meets and we threw in a few different you know special races including relays that um, we're still looking to do a DMR sometime in the future with a couple of pro teams. So that's cool. that's cool. But the relay piece is really, you know, so the team, we love seeing the, uh, the rivalries and, you know, and, and it's fun. So we were able to create that. So we ended up doing five of them in total. Um, and the requirement was um, we had to have a, you know, a sanctioned track. We had to have timing. We had to have officials. Um, and so, you know, 80% of that operational structure was in place We were because of our relationships. And then the last 20%, we literally kind of did the, through the seat of our pants, um, and, and really, uh, ended up having it, you know, really successful. And, um, so we, we finished at five, we started with one to see if it worked and then ended up having the second one at McKinsey river. And then the third, fourth, and fifth ones were at <clears throat> Newburgh High School in, outside of Portland. And and part of that was the shape of their track is exactly, almost exactly like Hayward Fields. Um, but it also had pretty wide curves. So based on, you know, the way Donovan was racing and we, we wanted to get some really, you know, great 800 meter times with the softer curves so cool so we were able to do that that's awesome <laughs> so in 2021 you had the portland track festival you had the stump town and then you also had mckenzie is that correct yes yeah did you do any pop-up meets at all the the mckenzie was pretty much a pop-up so okay. Okay. um yeah so the portland track festival again restrictions for on um even though there were people there, um, we could not charge, we couldn't create an event where we could, you know, pack the stands and have, you know, a huge number of spectators. We had people like yourself and Craig and, you know, coaches and agents and, um, you know, maybe family members of people that were competing. So, um, and so we, we did the Portland Track Festival. Um, it's a, the meet has been around for years, almost, I think, 12 years. It started as a middle school meet. Um, it evolved into a local hero meet, like a local elite, just to give them a chance to race. And then it eventually evolved into uh, really bringing, you had middle school, high school, college, and pros all competing in the same meet and it's a middle middle to height you know middle to long distance meet so we don't do any field events we've we've dabbled in some of the field events but it hasn't really um yeah i don't really i don't really feel that it's as uh impactful um and then you know we've been able to uh you know it's a fast track it's it's uh you know there's you know, Evan Jager ran 3.31 there a couple, few years back. And um, we've had some fantastic, um, you know, races there. And then we set it up. Uh, we it's we uh, set it up with the, the right pace setting. Um, we, you know, it's part of our, our budget. Um, and Portland Track, by the way, is a 501c3 nonprofit. We're all volunteers. None of us get paid. Um, and so basically all the money goes back into the meets and the athletes and the pace setting. So how long has the club been around? Um, well, it's interesting. You know, I mean, there's been a Portland track club. Even I ran for Portland track when I was a kid, I ran age group track and oh, cool. I was an age group, you know, phenom. And, uh, and so I still have my Portland track, uh, sweatshirt. Um, nice. Yeah, so it's pretty cool that I'm now kind of leading, you know, it might not be the same club, but it's, uh, but I think, you know, the Portland Track Organization has been around probably 12, 14 years. And, uh, and we've, uh, you know, it's just, you know, it's evolved over time. And, um, 
you know, we've, we've been able to really um, get some really high quality individuals on the board. Um, and that's what's also enabled us to really evolve as a, as an organization. Portland is one of the most eccentric and wonderful cities in the United States. And uh, I've been visiting since the 1980 Olympic trials. And I remember spending a few nights just going to jazz stuff back then. Um, the, and, and your city has become known for a wonderful um, eccentric program, Portlandia, which is, you know, when I'm having, when I'm editing, um, I put that on in the background. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and there's an episode I replay where you 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 they go to the commune to find the chicken. Oh yeah, I can't get that one out of my head. You know, yeah. And, um, it, it's just so messed up. And then you guys have come up with a, a a homage almost to the city and everything else, and you call it Trackmania. And you guys have a great sense of humor. Um, how did the Trackmania uh, podcast? And, you know, the, the, and I call it a podcast. I'm not sure that's the right word. Yeah. Uh, but I, I think there's this whole thing about, you know, it's the video and the audio and the, and the programming. And, 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 and um, so we'll call it the Tracklandia uh, programming. But how do you do that? And where did that come from? Yeah. So it's actually a really great story. Um, so is when I, took over as the president of Portland Track about this is my sixth year, about six years ago. Um, I can never leave anything alone. Um, and that's, and we'll talk about Incubator U just to show you, I have a methodology of kind of applying to organizations and teams and things that evolve it. And um, so when I took over, we, we went through a rebranding of the organization and, and really came down to athletes first, as I mentioned before. And, but also um, at the time the board was, you know, we'd have these two massive events that people volunteered for. And we also, by the way, we also have a youth meet that's around the same time of the Portland track festival that has about a thousand kids and then started a, middle school cross country meet that's free that's in the fall that has about 2,500 kids. So we're not just those two meets. Um, and so between the Portland Track Festival and um, the Stumptown one year, they were a week apart. And it was the year that I had uh, I brought Mikey Brannigan out um, to race and his coach, Sonia. And, um, and so I basically during the week, had a uh, set up a um, interview with Mikey and his coach, and then brought in the Oregon um, Autistic Society to to just list, have parents understand how Sonia works with Mikey, and it was a fascinating thing. But at the same time, I'm not that interesting. Um, so 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 I so I wanted Portland Track to actually have kind of a you know a, a, a gathering to you know, because Portland actually is a bigger track and field city than Eugene. There's more, you've got the Krausers and the Wilkins and Rupp and, or, you know, night. I mean, it's a massive track and running city, but after our events, it kind of, it kind of went dormant. And so I was trying to figure out a way to, um, you know, activate, you know, in the off season, you know, a, in a dialogue and track town does a really good job with their track. I think it was like their track town Tuesday talks down in Eugene. And so <clears throat> in my second year, um, Jeff Merrill, who was a, um, employee at Nike approached me about joining the board or getting more involved in Portland track. And so the way I operate is like, Hey, what do you like to do? And he's like, well, I kind of like to write. It's like, oh, that's great. And then um, about the same week, Andrew Weeding uh, just retired from competition. He moved to Portland, I had heard. So I went and had breakfast with him and basically asked him what he wanted to do when he grew up. And, uh, and he goes, well, I'd love to make videos. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Do you know Jeff? And so basically I put the two of them together for lunch one day. And I said, you guys come back with, you know, I'm not that interesting. You guys come up with what we want to do for Portland track as far as the 
um, the, the messaging year round to keep people's minds on the sport. And they came back and they said, Hey, we want to do a show. I'm like, all right. And one of our other board members, we, we all agreed that Tracklandia, Track Portlandia was leaving town. Um, they had just finished their final season. And then, um, and then, so we said, well, let's call it Tracklandia. And so basically we started recording uh, and they, they just needed some camera equipment and a, and a venue. So I happened to have friends that owned a really amazing studio that was uh, downstream media. It's uh, they had this huge screen in the back. And so we were able to film uh, track landing episodes with Andy and Jeff that, you know, that first year. And, you know, we did it once a month and then we, we put it on Eventbrite. And so we actually had non-track people that showed up on date night. Wow. Which is, which to me was ultimate, you know, it's like, yeah. Hey, oh, this yeah. is cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's a free event. And it's like, Hey, we didn't realize there were Olympic athletes living in Portland. I just saw that guy at the grocery store. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so then, you know, then it became, you know, we had the show edited it. They put it up on our YouTube channel and then, um, but after every show, we would go next door to a little bar called Yours, Y-U-R-S. And it was a combo downtown Portland motorcycle bar, you know, grunge hangout pool bar. And basically our whole, the whole group would go and hang out and order food and drink beer. And, you know, so the, basically, you know, fans could actually interact with their heroes. And it was, and it was just such, such a magical, you know, thing. It was like, Hey, they're real people too. So that was kind of the, 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 the culture we kind of created with Tracklandia. And then, um, over time, you know, the pandemic hit and Jeff, Jeff had the, um, the shows in his basement. <laughs> in his wow, house. Wow. He had it in the bunker. Um, and then now he's, he has some of them in his, he's got his garage set up as a studio. Oh, that's great. And, and then, you know, then over time, you know, so just with, and kind of tying that to, um, the, the meets is the, the people that are now filming Tracklandia is a guy named JJ Vasquez, who is a professor at Portland state university at their film school. Oh, wow. And he's a big track fan and and so he's been instrumental in helping us you know produce these and but he's also got students that are helping and then on top of it you know when when it came close to the big friendlies um we didn't have a a signed agreement with any with runner space or flow track and you know it was we just finished our contract with flow track and so we decided I asked JJ, like, can we live, can you guys live stream? And so we, that's how we started live streaming our own events through our own channel. So you, you do something unique. Actually, I think people followed you afterwards. Um, I just did a, a podcast about what I'm calling bespoke uh, uh, track meets. And um, I had broken things up. I'd done something on the Diamond League and put it up. And I got a note back. Hey, what about all those small meets you wrote about? What about Portland? I mean, somebody, you know, they out, they do this all the time. And I said, you know, yeah, I got to think about that because you guys really did some pretty terrific things. But one of the things I liked was the whole streaming idea. And you charged a little bit for it. And then you put that money back into the athletes. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Explain how that worked. Because I really love that idea. Yeah. So we, um, so one, we, you know, we're, we're literally going hand to mouth on our operations. So we don't really have any sponsors, some paid. So that's, if we're to, if you're listening to this podcast, <laughs> we'd love to, if you like what we're doing, then we could actually highlight you in our live stream. If a little person dropped down from heaven um, and asked you a couple of questions, what does it cost to do the streaming the way you're doing? Is that a, I've been told it's five to 10 grand to do a meet right. Is that about in the area? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But when, okay. but when we did the big friendlies, yeah. the entire, and, and nobody really got paid. Um, yeah. But 
those those five meets we were able to pull off with that quality for fifteen thousand dollars were you using a t1 line what were you doing did you um that was one of the challenges in mckenzie was the you know the um we didn't have the connection so we filmed it and then we had to upload it the next day but yeah. like in 2020 but then wow. um yeah. uh but you know and that was the other element. Uh, Newburg High School had a good, like a fiber connection, and so does Jesuit. So, oh yeah, but I, you know, I went to Jesuit schools. You gotta Ignatius would demand that from wherever he's, you know, hanging right now. Um, yeah. The um, so I want to get back to the 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 thing about, um, and I'm sorry, I digress a lot. Okay, that's okay. There's I'm following you. Coffee. Um, the um, so what I really dug. Was you had a charge? It was five ninety nine to nine ninety nine. I'm trying to remember. Five ninety nine. Yeah. Okay. And so, did you take cost out of that, or did you just put it right into the athletes? Yeah. So we. So I think there was like ninety nine cents of that went to the you know the streaming service, pretty much, and then um, and then I would say two dollars went back to help pay for the production, and then three dollars of each went to the athletes so so we brought in between um between a portland track festival and Stumptown. i think we brought in about seventy thousand dollars wow and That's pretty awesome yeah so that was you know and and uh, and that was really without um a lot of advance notice it was incredibly new we we're super innovative and so you know we have a you know, nine months to plan out um, like this for next year. And and in addition, we hope to have fans in the stands packing it. So now the, the one thing I wanted to add in, and, and I just want to make sure I understood this or I misunderstood. Um, both the meets, I got a little time with Craig Masbach, you know, a friend from, you know, I actually ran part of the New York City Marathon with him uh, back in 1986. He went by. Um, but uh, the uh he was telling me that nike helped with kids under 18 what was how did the and i thought this was really cool yeah so what so we you know we didn't we were going forward with our and communicating what we were doing how we were doing it completely transparent saying look we want we want to make sure you know if you can't buy if we can't have fans you know, for the cost of a beer or a ticket, just, you know, come live, we'll, you know, we'll, you know, live stream and you can watch the meet exclusively for five days. And then we put it back up on our YouTube channel. We were, Jeff Merrill was approached by someone in Nike brand saying, look, what you're doing. And um, we would, could you guys create a coupon for us to basically push out to our coaches? And, and so you could have, we could have watch parties for teams that could watch the Portland Track Festival or the Stumptown Twilight. And so we generated quite a few, you know, there was no clear budget as to what it was, but they, it turned out to be a significant, you know, um, in, investment for, um, uh, you know, I mean, it was small really for Nike, but, it was done for the right reasons. It was, it provided access to a great event for high school kids to be inspired. And, you know, that was, you know, it was just really, and there were no strings attached. So we didn't necessarily have to, you know, promote it at, hey, Nike did this. It was, they did it for the right reasons. And, and you know, I, I don't know if you knew, but I'm, I was a 30 year Nike employee. So I understand, um, you know, a lot of times, you know, that's part of my thing with Portland track is I, I, I'm trying to, you know, be Switzerland as far as, you know, sponsorship, you know, if I was to get, you know, brands involved, I'd love to have a, like an airline or Airbnb that will help get athletes there and help them sleep. You know, so that's, that's, the, that's, that's the thing that yeah, makes total sense. There used to be a guy, remember Chris Lukasic? Yeah. 33 guy. So Chris was one of the founding guys of Airbnb. Okay. And he's recently gone um, because I was reaching out to him. They sponsored um, 
when I was in Gothenburg in 13, and oh no, in Zurich, in Zurich in 14 too, um, the Airbnb sponsored the European Athletic Champs and they gave us a little coupon for 150 euros to put towards a place, you know? Right. And, and those are the kind of things that, you know, the, the creativity, it, it's, um, you know, the, the idea of going to the footwear companies, the footwear companies put over 100 million into races around the country on right. a, and athletes on a yearly basis. And I keep track of all that stuff. And, you know, Nike, they're prop that they're they have to be profitable companies or they can't do those things, and so we've got to find other sponsors, you know, yeah. and the oh, HMOs and the and you know the the local running stores, but there's stuff out there, and it's it's just um, I recall um, I think one of the more creative ones was Mark Wetmore at um, at the New Balance uh, Indoor and the um, uh, and and then his Adidas event he got a, a, a restaurant involved and you know what they did was they did a hosted a dinner for everybody and that you know people like to get fed you know it's uh, uh and and uh, portland has there's an airbnb office here we're you know one of the hubs for southwest in alaska um we've got you know some of the best beer and restaurants oh, gosh, yeah. in, the, oh. in the world yeah. so, Fantastic. Yeah. so yeah. all those yeah. things all those things runners like one of the things that I've really liked about uh, the meets was um, one, the amount of support from the athletes, you know, from the Galen Rupps of the world um, and Craig Engels and, you know, Matt Centrowitz. And I've got to tell you a funny thing about Matt. Uh, so I've known Matt's dad, you know, we, um, he was way ahead of me, but we ran cross country. I was at Santa Clara, he was at Oregon and everything. And I've teased Matt a couple of times and told him that, uh, you know, he's got some of the same attitude as his father, which he really enjoys. But um, when Matt did that three times the 800 at the uh, track classic. So I put a post up that night and it drew over 35,000 retweets. <laughs> and so I tried three more and it totally blew everything away that I'd had for the summer. In fact, the only time, the next one was Nigel Amos. Um, I did something on night, you know, and, and just talking about how he looks like, he reminds me of Joe Cocker sometimes, you know, with his kind of movements and stuff. And I just love watching him race, right? And people, you know, then that went crazy. And uh, But Matthew is obviously very popular, Craig Engels. Um, mm -hmm. Galen was followed really well, you know, and... But it, it was like they were allowed to be themselves. They're, they they got to talk to who they wanted to do. And Craig is very effusive, you know. And, and, and uh, um, the uh, I really want him to do a Trailer Park Boys whole program. I mean, I don't know if you've watched his yeah. Oh, yeah. stuff. It's it's just yeah. there was the coat. I swear they pull off a foreigner, you know, rock tour. Um, yeah. But it's just, you know. The sense of humor and the eccentricity, it's what's really building the sport. Yeah. And, and the, the, the last two years, which you guys have done, I think it's been some of the finest stuff coming into track and field. And I think it's bringing in a new fan who um, may not even like sports much. Or, and maybe they ran cross country or their brother or sister ran cross country, but they're kind of going, you know, this stuff's kind of cool. And God, these guys actually have a sense of humor. They're not, don't have a stick up there, you know, but yeah. and it's, um, that's, that's the story of these bespoke meets, you know? Yeah. It, it, and I think, idea. and I think that, um, that's the thing I absolutely love about the Portland track festival. We did, it wasn't quite as evident this year when you came, but, um, mm -hmm. we do have like middle school races and this year we did have like a high school 3200 which you know there, there were nine kids that broke nine minutes from oregon that we don't run a 3200 in oregon and uh but those kids <clears throat> both boys and girls were warming up on the infield with craig and matt and you just don't get that and you know it's not a it's not a showcase it's not a you know it's not in a kind of a elite event it's very 
low key and, you know, people are laying on the infield, you know, in, in groups. And um, I think that's the beauty of the, you know, it just say, Hey, these people are real people. And then I think the athletes appreciate it as well. They're like, wow, I remember being, how cool this would have been if I was growing up and got to see my hero. Oh yeah. No, no. I mean, it was, um, it, uh, I had been, I had frequented the track when Paul Banta was putting on the series and, uh, you know, Paul was rather innovative in his, the, the shot put, uh, competitions were, some of my favorites and then uh they did that uh one year they did it where and it was the sad thing was just in the pouring rain and they had five grand in money and putskus outscored um uh todd williams todd ran a 10 and just the most horrific stuff and they just used the portuguese, portuguese tables and it was fun you know and that, that was those are some of the neat that place has hosted some pretty cool events and um how is Stumptown Coffee involved with you guys for the Twilight? Is that they're not? Called? It's just Portland's known as Stumptown, so we just okay. Call okay, it. all right. I was just curious because I yeah. always get put their I throw their URL and hashtag in because I well, maybe to, they should be maybe yeah, they, should, they be should be because our it's good sponsor for it's sure. Good coffee, you know, and yeah, uh, it is. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, my drug of choice is Pete's, and you know, it's just when I'm on deadline, you know, I mainline <laughs> that stuff, but. Uh, the um, what was your favorite moment at the track festival this year? I would say the most the, my favorite. Um, well, the, the Portland Track Festival was that fifteen hundred with Hobbs. Oh my That's, God! Yeah, that was <clears throat> when he when he was closing on all the pros, and Whoa. then um, when. You know, and it was really m magical to see guys like Ingalls and Nick Willis, just like, you know, and all these other guys just like, man, that was awesome. Good job. I mean, so it was just a great, great, great um, experience. And and then, um, you know, the only thing that was missing in that race, but we kind of knew it, um, Josh Kerr um, had, had competed the week before, it was a little bit tired. And so part of it was Danny, you know, asked us to you know, set up a race the next week for him. And, and we did. <laughs> so. No, that was brilliant. I mean, in, in, I, I met Josh in 15 in Birmingham and I, uh, he just not gotten selected and he was pretty down. And I, I told him that I wasn't a, uh, a stalker and that I did a, a, some stuff in the U S and I said, but, you know, selectors are as bad as, you know, it comes sometimes and they don't appreciate your stuff. And I reminded him of Seb Cody get picked a couple of times. He's like, you're kidding. I said, that was after he won Olympic gold, man. So <laughs> just, just so you know. And so I just wanted to give him a little bit. Now he's, he's a, uh, a really interesting kid. And, and, and what he and Danny have done is very special. You know, yeah. and it's a, I really love the coach athlete relationships and it's um, it keeps it fun. The, um, when I would say that the there's been a lot of trust built between these groups uh, from the coaches and athletes with, you know, even through the when we had the big friendlies the year before, they they knew what we were doing was, in fact, some, it, you know, by the second or third meet, they started to realize that we were doing it for them and not for our own good. Yeah. And um, and I think that has really played well. Um and that really is what um, triggered the McKenzie International too. Talk to me about that meet. That was really, I mean, I, I just, I've enjoyed it from the photos and from the results. And, and um, you did a meet during the Olympic trials on the break night and it was international athletes. There were a few Americans, yeah, uh, but, um, and, and it was really to help that community with, was it to bring in Wi-Fi for them to bring in? No. Yeah. So, so the year before when we had the, the big friendly meet up at McKinsey river, which is the, literally this, this field. Of, I'm, in fact, I'm heading up there after our interview. Um, but the, the McKinsey river track is, is 35, 40 minutes from Eugene from Hayward field. It's up in the, it's literally dropped in the middle of these mountains next to the McKinsey River. It's like a field of dreams in the middle of the mountains. Beautiful, absolutely gorgeous. 
we had our meet there in uh, July, July 16th, 2020. And six weeks later, um, the entire valley was devastated by those wildfires. So the entire town of Blue River was gone. Um, hundreds of people lost their homes. Um, it was incredibly devastating. And, and so over the year, we helped raise a little money to help re, you know, restore the, the track did not get severely damaged, but the fire came right up to the fence. And um, so Bainon came in and cleaned it. Um, I stayed in touch with the community. And so basically after the Portland Track Festival this year, Dan, um, Dathan Ritzenheim and um, uh, um, I'm blanking on the, the Hoka, but Dathan approached us. Mike and, McManus? Uh, oh, sure or not. Hoka, Hoka elite out of oh Bob you know, oh, oh gosh uh, kid from Missouri um, yeah okay I know okay. you're talking about anyway yeah. but they but Dathan contacted us and and basically said hey I've got you know I've got these international athletes that are you know they can't leave the country they can't run in the U.S. Olympic trials they still need tune-ups for Tokyo because they've been selected and there's a few athletes out there that um still need time qualifying times and would you guys put could you put on a meet so we said yeah well you know let's this is what it's cost and you know again it's that three to five thousand dollar range that we're you know it's providing a service then i contacted my team you know my my contacts at mckenzie river and then on top of it i was working with this group out of eugene called onward eugene that um, it was literally helping bring fiber and connectivity up to the valley there. And so, so I question, I said, Hey, um, Matt Sayers, a friend of mine that, um, you know, basically I started working with is like, man, if we could actually get a high level of connectivity to this track, we could live stream events from there. And so basically we were on a, it was like an amazing collaborative effort where we got, um, you know, we got uh, high speed internet connected to the track. The track was ready. We, we, we did a pay-per-view. It wasn't, you know, big because, you know, we didn't have time to market it. It was literally, we had two, two weeks to plan this thing, but <clears throat> we also decided to charge, you know, five bucks at the door. And it was actually pretty amazing to see a traffic jam in Blue River, Oregon, because people had come up wow. from Eugene, up and they and they got to see the devastation that had happened in this valley. It's like yeah. uh, it was it's disheartening, and people you saw chimneys and you know just no homes and and but then you show up at this track and it's absolutely beautiful and they got to line the track and see charlie hunter run 144.2 and yeah you know it's and it was and they got to again interact with their heroes and um you know so it was really it was really a special night so we raised about forty five hundred dollars well that's cool for the community and um i'm actually after our interview i'm heading down to eugene and bringing ed um uh uh ed uh Gorman from USATF up there yeah. to look at the track. And That's the, a potential. The, the coach that we were forgetting the name of was Ben Rosario. Ben, Ben, and yeah, ben sorry. Just uh, one of those gems, and and he doesn't get the appreciation uh, that that he deserves because yeah. what, what a creative force. The the we're down to the last couple of questions. You survived forty four minutes, so you've done really well. Michael, and uh, you know, I haven't had any meltdowns or anything, so that's really good. Um, to me, I mean, you, you've been at Nike for a long time, or you were at Nike for a long time. I mean, I've worked with them since 1982 with Mike Casper, and I was in Runner's World, and uh, you know, and uh, uh, and, and I've watched the brand grow, but and I also um, I appreciate that you're trying to be um non-brand affiliated and i think that's probably it's probably been one of the biggest challenges for you i mean danny 
Mackey, Heart of Gold, Ben, the whole, all the coaches you work with, Mark Rowland and, and, you know, Jerry, I can never say enough about him. And I'm, you know, I feel sad about all the challenges they're having right now, but they're good people and uh, they will, you know, they'll figure it out. Um, but it's, um, if people wanted to help the club and wanted to help you guys, uh, is there an email that they can uh, reach out to you at? Yeah, it's simple. It's Michael at PortlandTrack.com. Cool. Okay. Um, we're going to uh, get this up probably the next two weeks. I'll let you know. And then uh, what I'd also love to do, if you get a chance, would you send me your three favorite Portlandia episodes? I'd love to do a little piece about them and get them out. Portlandia or tra Tracklandia? Track, Tracklandia. I'm sorry. Okay. I can send you my three favorite Portlandia oh, ones too I, I, because – because I'm in two of them. One of my really? bucket lists. I, yeah, one of my hey, bucket lists. Items. Send me that, please. Okay, <laughs> I, I will do that too. I mean, we. It, it's I, the show. It, the Portlandia show is just so bizarre, and I just I, I get in the space and I just kind of go. Okay, I, I yeah, I know what I need. I'm, I'm in two is, episodes. Yeah. So. Oh wow. Yeah, that and Shit's Creek are my two. I mean, like <laughs> I, I've now. Uh, watched every episode of Shit's Creek with my girlfriend. <laughs> We're going on the fourth time around. Yeah. And you see something new each time, and you're just kind of going, How can anything be more magnificent? You know? And yep. it's just like, and, and Portland is like that. And then you guys are able to find something mm. fun and get your own expression. And that's, I think, part of the, the coolest thing. Um, you know, Steve Prefontaine said that uh, running is like art. And it's uh, it, it's it's just a creative process, and I always thought that he, I, I was supposed to see him run in 1975 at the SF Indoor, and uh, at the time I was 17, and Mom said you're babysitting your brothers and sisters, so I still have the ticket. And oh, he, no. ran, he ran against John Nino that night, and uh, in a two mile, and oh, it was wow. a 160 yard yeah. track, and I I mean I got to run on it years a few years later for, for 3000 meters, which was like, I'm going, how he ran that fast just boggles my mind. Yeah, but, yeah. um, you know, the, the, I love the spirit of what you guys do. Um, I'll be there this next year. If I can help you promote it. And, yeah, it and, 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 you know. and, and I'd say just one other thing that, and I'll send you an art sport Oregon just did a big, um, article that, um, kind of really captures the spirit of what I'm trying to do. And it's, um, yeah, we post really bring, that bringing, bringing track to the people. And so yeah. I'm, I'm working on the McKinsey River track. I'm building a track and music venue out in Maupin, which wow. overlooks the Deschutes River. Yeah. Um, so that's what the, and I'll send you the link to that, but we're Please. about to surface it. And it could be the most spectacular um, few point of a 10K and the, the pole vault looks uh, over the Deschutes River Canyon. So it's like wow. one of the most spectacular venues. And and the goal is to get it ready to potentially have some pop-up meets in prior to the worlds. I mean, I want to basically do some special events around the state, um, you know, leading up to the world championships. So that's Ooh. ultimately my goal. And connect Who's these doing your track at Deschutes? What? Who's building the track at Deschutes? <laughs> Well, the Bainon is surfacing it, but we I've basically been leading the effort in building it. So. Yeah, Bainon is a character. Um, I got him to do a uh, a track a trail for Clinton, and he was a, a Republican. And um, I just sent him a note and I said, you know, President Clinton needs a place to work out. And he was he never took any credit for it. He was the guy that was involved with that. So I was. Thought he was pretty cool, you know. We're we're still paying him, so yeah, well, that's, that's good. Well, yeah, no, no, no. It track service <laughs> is so all the have, all the heavy lifting is gone to this point to get him to pay to, yeah, to yeah. surface it. So yeah, but they're a great partner. So Michael, right. this is this has been so much fun, and thank you again for your time. And let me do the little traditional end. Um, okay, guys, this is. Uh, Socialing the distance, we've been with Michael Bergman. He's the president of Portland Track, and he's survived almost 50 minutes with us, which is a new run, blog, run, um, socialing the distance record. But you had great stuff, and we really love what you do. Michael, thank you. My best to your club, and I look forward to seeing you next year. Okay, sounds good, Larry. Thank Take you care. for having me.
Hey, sports fans, Larry Eater. This is the Socialing the Distance epilogue, so it's Larry's monologue. Today, we had a wonderful uh, interview with Michael Bergman. He's the president of Portland Track. What a visionary. And just a, a 30-year Nike exec <coughs> who wants to give back to the community. And um, he has helped um, build a track in McKenzie or helped revitalize the, the, the McKenzie River uh, uh, track and did a meet there, the McKenzie River invite. Did a pop up in uh, 2020 there. They're building a, a track in uh, uh, Maupin um, up off the Deschutes River. This sounds like it's going to be magnificent. Um, but we talked a lot about the Portland Track Festival, the Stumptown uh, uh, Twilight, which is not related to Stumptown Coffee. I thought it was. And uh, it's just because Portland's called Stumptown. And um, the magnificent support he gets from Danny Mackey and Brooks Beast, Jerry Schumacher with Bowerman, Mark Rowland with Oregon Track Club, uh, Ben Rosario with um, Hoka Elite, and many of the other clubs in the area, and his desire to really put something back in, including finding home tracks and communities for a lot of these international teams that will be traveling from around uh, the world to uh, Eugene, because many may not even think about this, but in a world championships, um, there's probably 30 or 40 teams that are big enough to have uh, a track and a hotel where they house their teams so they can have some private time to train. And where are they gonna do that in Oregon? That's gonna be a challenge. So um, Michael's trying to put those situations together and, they uh, we're going to have some episodes posted up here on uh, Tracklandia. We learned about how that programming came about, which is absolutely fun. And the the Portland Track Festival is normally right after the NCAA's and uh, our pre, and it's for the elite athletic community as well as the high school and college community in uh, uh, in the Portland area. The meets are put on. In a lot of ways, this is the last chance to qualify for various things, including the Nationals. And the Stumptown is pretty much the last chance meet to qualify for the uh, the U.S. champs. And uh, they do good stuff. It's all volunteers. Um, I thought what they did for $5.99 for streaming, um, and they're giving three bucks from each streaming to help with the athletes. I thought that was brilliant. I also wanted to... Uh, Pat, uh, the folks at Nike with Craig Masback on the back for supporting under 18 year olds, um, being able to get the streaming um, and, and covering the cost there. And, uh, you know, they, they raised about 70 grand uh, doing those, uh, um, those streams. So I think it's totally cool. And again, um, one of the reasons why track and field has come out of, it's coming out of the pandemic looking pretty good and smelling pretty good is because of bespoke focused events like what Portland Track is doing. The Stumptown Classic, the Portland Track Festival, the McKenzie International, the bespoke meets they did in uh, the big friendlies they did in uh, 2020 are all good for the community, but it's also respects the local culture and that's what we need to do in other parts of the country. Santa Monica Track Classic used to do that. I mean, that went back down in um, in the 90s, you know. And from that, other meets were built. And those things are important. Um, you know, last year we had, um, uh, we had Jesse Williams putting on his sound running events. We had Chris Chavez and the team at Miles of Trials and Trials of Miles. We had Paul Doyle putting on the American Track League. We had several other folks in there too, doing some really cool stuff. And that stuff's important. And we need that to um, make, make the sport work, get the word out there, inspire people. So hats off to Michael Bergman and the Portland, and Portland Track. And um, thank you again for contributing to our sport. This is Larry Eater, a run, blog, run, socially in the distance. Stay safe. Keep running, keep walking.